Today, I'm going to beat Pokemon Crystal with only a Corsola. This video is going to feature footage from my Corsola stream, as well as a brand new playthrough. It's also worth noting that I'm going to be doing brand new voiceover for this entire video, just to make sure that it flows really well. After all, I think Corsola deserves it. This thing is just so cute. One more note before we get into this video, I have done a previous Corsola video. However, that was recorded when I was playing at three times game speed, so I do need to redo this run so that I can get easily comparable results. Now, let's get into it. For base stats, Corsola has 55 HP and attack, 85 defense and special defense, 65 special attack, and 35 speed. It also has a fast growth rate, which is quite good. This is the second best growth rate for solo challenges. It is slower than the medium slow growth rate until level 30. Its move pool is honestly decent. It starts with just tackle, but then quickly it learns harden and bubble at level 13. After that, it gets some fantastic moves, recover, bubble beam, and ancient power. Through TMs and HMs, it gets access to headbutt and return, as well as rollout, rain dance, earthquake, psychic, and surf. Also, Pokemon Crystal features the first instance in the entire mainline series where there is a move tutor. And I'm going to be able to use him to teach Corsola Ice Beam, which is fantastic coverage against grass types which do four times damage to my water rock typing. It is worth noting though that he's only accessible after I defeat the league. So unfortunately for me, no Ice Beam for Lance. One final note about my moveset, you will note that Hidden Power is a dark type move. This is because my Corsola has perfect DVs for this first playthrough. I'm only going to be allowed to use Hidden Power in my second playthrough. This is just so that I keep the videos as interesting as possible. After all, Hidden Power Ice would really help this thing out. Now if you've been watching the footage carefully, you will have noticed that I had to run away from a bell sprout because catching it was just way too risky. Vine Whip does massive damage to Corsola. And I am really not having good luck against these bell sprout because I keep coming back to this area trying to catch them and they just keep doing so much damage. During the stream I had people suggest that maybe I should catch Oddish in the forest instead of catching Bellsprout, and on examination, I do think that that is going to be the better play for me to do going forward. After all, there is a 50% chance to encounter Oddish there. Either way, getting a little bit of extra training in before Faulkner is not the worst idea. After all, today with my rock typing, he is going to spam Mud Slap against me. During the stream, I was pretty sure that I was going to need level 13 in order to defeat him, but I decided to give it one try at level 12 just in case. He leads with a level 7 Pidgey, and the unfortunate thing here is that Tackle is only doing a third, so I have my accuracy lowered twice before the Pidgeotto comes out. Luckily I didn't miss it all there. However, it was at this moment that I realized that I had forgotten a berry, and as a result I'm pretty sure his ace is just going to knock me out. But then, even with minus 6 accuracy, I am able to hit two tackles in a row and defeat Faulkner on my first attempt. Now keep this fight in mind for later because we're going to have to talk about it. But for now, let's head to Union Cave. Here I'm going to take the time to mention just how bad Corsola has it in the early game. Faulkner has super effective damage with Mud Slap, which also lowers accuracy. If you want to train for him, all of the surrounding areas have Bell Sprout, which can hit for four times damage. Sprout Tower is no better because it's packed full with Bell Sprout. And then, just as soon as you think you're away from all of the grass types, the rival in Azalea Town is going to have a bay leaf that knows Razor Leaf. So I really need to spend time in this next route of the game fighting as many optional trainers as is possible to get the highest level so that when I beat Bugsy, I am not going to lose too much time against the rival. Now of course I'm using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to set which starter Corsola replaced, so I could have had the rival pick like the fire type starter for instance. But I don't really think that that's in the spirit of the game, so I'm going to have to contend with the more difficult option right now. I defeat all the rockets in Slowpoke well, after that I head into Bugsy's gym, making sure to face every single trainer for the maximum amount of experience. And now, it's time for the second gym leader. Now. 
Now, of course, Law has a really good strategy available against Bugsy. Because he starts with Metapod, which only knows Tackle, and I resist it, I can easily set up Harden six times, which will allow me to minimize the damage that the eventual Scyther does with Fury Cutter. Eventually when it comes out, it's not doing that much damage. However, Bubble is doing pathetic damage. This move is so bad. And as a result, the Scyther is able to stack up Fury Cutters and knock Corsola out. Okay, so I'm going to have to train until I am level 25 where Corsola gets access to Bubble Beam. I'm just going to guide your eyes to the timer. It's 21 minutes and now it's 29 minutes. That training took a lot of time. Grinding in Johto is always so painful. But now with Bubble Beam, I should stand a chance against Bugsy. I decided to play slightly over safe here by setting up two times with Harden before knocking out both the Metapod and the Kakuna with a single hit from Bubble Beam each. Last is Scyther, I go for Bubble Beam, and it's a two hit. So with that, I have earned myself the second badge, and I guess the prize is not really a prize, I have to face the rival. So I'm not worried about the Ghastly at all, I just one-shot it with Bubble Beam. What I'm really worried for is the Bay Leaf and its Razor Leaf. Okay, that didn't do as much as I was expecting, but it looks like my Bubble Beam is going to take four hits to knock it out, and as a result, it takes me down with a third Razor Leaf. What I was wondering here is if I have a damage roll against the Bayleaf where it is possible to knock it out in three hits. However, in the next battle, it doesn't look like that's the case, but Bayleaf just used Reflect and Growl, so I managed to knock it out. All that's left is Zubat, and Bubble Beam gets the one hit. In the forest, I can finally catch myself a cut user. After that, I get access to Headbutt, which is a great replacement for Tackle. And then after taking care of all of the regular Goldenrod errands and fighting a bunch of trainers north of the city, it's time to take on Whitney. Against Whitney's Clefairy, I just don't want Metronome to roll anything too bad. It gets Cotton Spore and it just fails and I knock it out with the second Bubble Beam. Okay, now it's time for Miltank. By the way, Rock does not resist Rock, so Rollout is going to be doing neutral damage here. However, it looks like Bubble Beam is doing more than enough damage, so I'm able to easily defeat her. And with that, I have earned the third badge, which gives me a 12.5% boost to my speed stat. And from here, things are going to dramatically speed up for Corsola. That's because in Ecritique City, I can face all of the Kimono Girls, earn the HM for Surf, and teach this move in the place of Bubble Beam. I head west of the city, collecting the Mint Berry as well as the Nugget, and then I head into Olivine City where I catch myself a Krabby, take care of the Lighthouse, and then I backtrack to the Burned Tower to take on the Rival. In this battle, he is going to be much easier. I can use Surf to one-shot both the Haunter as well as the Magnemite, and then he sends in Bayleaf. Here I figured Surf would do a lot of damage, and it almost does half. Since I'm not going to knock it out in only two hits, I go for Headbutt, which causes a flinch, and then I take it out on the next turn. All that's left is Zubat, I go for Surf, and finish the rival off without taking a single hit point of damage. With him out of the way, it is now time to face the Ghost-type Gym Leader. Okay, Surf, I really need you to carry me throughout this fight. I knock the first Ghastly out without it setting up Curse. Next is Haunter. This one also knows Curse, but I once again take it out with a single hit. Now it's time for the Gengar. It outspeeds me, going for Hypnosis, but luckily it misses, and then Surf hits, but it's not quite enough. Gengar goes for Hypnosis again, missing, and then I finish it off. So all he's got left is one final Haunter. Like, why is this the last Pokemon that he sends out? It is so weird. Anyways, I just clean it up and earn myself the fourth badge. All right, so we're going to jump right ahead to the Chuck battle. You might think that this is going to be hard because he is a fighting type gym leader, but believe me, his Primeape is completely useless. Then against the Polyrath, I get a turn one flinch. After that, it uses Mind Reader, hits me with Hypnosis, but my Mint Berry cures it, and I finish him off. With this badge, I can now use Fly, so I'm going to head back to Cherry Grove City to pick up the Mystic Water, which is going to give Surf a major improvement to its damage. Okay, because in this video I am actually trying to go fairly fast, no 50 minute video today, we're going to skip the entire rocket plotline and head right to Price. With Headbutt, I am able to two-shot the Seal, the Dugong's next, and I take it out with three hits from Headbutt. All that remains is his terrifying ace, Pyloswine, which takes super effective damage from Surf, and I knock it out in a single hit. Alright, up next is Jasmine. 
And I can't believe this is the case, but she's actually easier for Corsola than Price was, because Surf is able to one-hit all three of her Pokémon. Okay, Rocket Plotline, and the rival has a Meganium, so let's talk about that one because it knows Razor Leaf. However, in this case, the AI clearly knows that it can't get a one hit, so it sets up Reflect on the first turn, I use Surf, then it goes for Razor Leaf doing less than half, and I finish it off. So with that, Corsola has cleared this section of the game and is ready to take on Claire. Now I haven't talked about my moveset for a while, so we've got some major upgrades. I've replaced Headbutt with Return, and I've also learned Ancient Power. One thing to note about this move in Generation 2, if you knock the opponent's Pokémon out, there is no chance for the Omni Boost to trigger. By the way, that's why I never got it when I was using Aerodactyl in Generation 2. In this battle, I managed to make it to her Kingdra, but my health is so low and I'm paralyzed because I was unable to one-hit the Dragonairs, so this one ends in a loss. After that, I went south of Blackthorn City to fight some more trainers to level up because I figured that I needed better damage ranges, but then one of you kind viewers mentioned in the chat that perhaps I could get through Claire if I just used Recover more often. So I went back to face her at level 53 to see if that strategy would work. Of course, I'm going to have to be able to get through this battle with Paralysis. Now I am using the Pink Bow because I think I might be able to KO the Dragonairs if I get a really good range. I managed to get through the first two without having to use Recover, and then on the third one, I recover to full health, take it down to red health, recover one more time into the green, and knock it out. Okay, so it's time for Kingdra. It hits Surf, which does about a quarter. My return takes it down to low health. Alright, it looks like I'm gonna do it. It hits Surf again, doing another quarter. Return connects, and with that, I have defeated Claire. The next fight is against Rival 5 in Victory Road. The biggest question for this one is what is the Meganium going to do? And to answer that question, I want to talk a little bit about how the Generation 2 AI chooses its moves. At the start of the turn, it rolls for damage to see what all of its moves would do. And if none of them are going to get a one hit, then it is going to choose to set up instead. For the Meganium specifically, this means it has a chance to use either Reflect or Poison Powder. Obviously, if it chooses to put the screen up, it's probably going to get a single attack in, but if it uses Poison Powder, then I'm not sure if it will. In this case, it goes for the status condition. I do what looks like a little bit less than half, but I must have rolled better damage on the next hit because I knocked the Meganium out, and from there, Corsola has no problems with the rest of this fight. Alright, so so far so good. Corsola is not really struggling. Only three resets and I've made it all the way to the league. However, it isn't doing very well in terms of time, but like this playthrough isn't full of suffering. So let's see how the league is going to be. Up first is Will, and he leads with a Zatu. I get really bad luck here. Confusion and self-inflicted damage for three turns in a row, and I just barely squeeze in an Ancient Power and knock his lead out. Okay, so he sends out Executor next. Previously I said there's only one Grass type in the league, but there are in fact two. The Executor is one of them. It just doesn't know any damage dealing Grass type moves. I guess it does have Leech Seed, and it deals damage over time, but nothing that deals direct damage. As a result, it is not going to be able to hit me for much damage, uh, unless it gets minus one to my special defense, because now all of Will's Pokémon are going to start doing a lot of damage every hit. So now, Corsola is on the clock. Two returns, get the KO, and then Will sends in Slowbro. Now, this thing is going to set up a lot. It loves to go for, like, Amnesia first turn, Curse second turn. So I figured that I should just attack and finish it off. My second hit does not take it out. It uses Psychic, and Corsola once again just barely survives. Okay, here's the thing, though. Recover is fantastic. I heal a lot and finally knock the Slowbro out. Against the Ace Zatu, I get a one-shot. And all that's left is Jinx, but this thing is so physically frail, so I also one-shot it. And with that, the first member of the league is defeated. Things do not get harder for Corsola now. Koga is completely trivial. I one-hit the Ariados, two-hit the Fortress, two-hit the Muck, one-hit KO the Venomoth, which is a bit surprising. It is a Grass Electric type. And then I almost KO the Crobat. Koga heals it. And then I two-hit KO with Surf, so that was much easier than Will. 
Okay, so Will was annoying, but he didn't have a type advantage. And up next is Bruno, and he does. The Hitmontop is first. It has no fighting type moves that can deal damage, but it does no dig. It does a little bit before it goes down. Then against the Hitmonlee, I get the one-hit KO, which is really relieving because this thing has fantastic fighting type moves. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I played Hitmonlee in Pokemon Yellow the other day on stream, and uh, even with fantastic fighting type moves, that thing was really frustrating to play. Okay, next is Hitmonchan, and this thing knows Mach Punch, so it is going to move first. And because my return fails to get the KO, it gets a second one in before I take it down. Okay, so Corsola's has taken some damage, and now Bruno is going to send in his ace, Machamp. I honestly didn't think that I would survive a cross chop, so I decided to go for recover to have more health. Unfortunately for me, it looks like cross chop is doing more damage than recover heals, plus it is a high critical hit rate move. However, it doesn't have great accuracy, and it also has small PP. I guess there are uh, some trade-offs to being as buff as Machamp is. When it misses, I take the opportunity and use Surf twice, knocking the Machamp out. So I've made it to the Onyx, and I easily KO with Surf. I can't believe it. Corsola got through this fight. Okay, so we're moving on to Karen, and even if you don't have a type disadvantage, this fight is usually challenging. Luckily for me though, the Umbreon misses one sand attack, but it hits the second one because I three hit it. So that is bad news. Next is Vileplume, and this is the only grass type in the league with a grass type damage dealing move. But it's gonna prioritize using status conditions, so it wants to paralyze Corsola with Stun Spore, but it misses, and so I get the free knockout. Okay, but we are not out of the woods yet because the Gengar outspeeds, and it can use Destiny Bond. Turn 2, it does. But Sand Attack saves me because Surf misses. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And from here, the Gengar just chooses to use Lick, I use Recover, it uses Lick again, and then my Surf KOs. Alright, so now I have type advantages. Ancient Power 1 hits the Murkrow. Next, Karen sends in her Ace, Houndoom, I go for Surf, and it gets the 1 hit. So, Corsola beat Karen on its first attempt. Well done. Now, to prepare for Lance, I am going to give it the Hard Stone, because I want to boost Ancient Power's damage as much as is possible. After all, Lance's entire team are part flying types. Lance leads with Gyarados, and this thing isn't an issue, because it usually sets up Rain Dance and I can just two-hit it. Okay, so the Hard Stone isn't going to give me KOs on the Dragonites, which means I am going to have to play this fight paralyzed. But as we saw earlier against Claire, this isn't really as big of an issue as it is with most Pokemon, because I can just use Recover to heal, and then roll the dice more on the status condition. And making things better for Corsola here is the fact that the first Dragonite that Lance sends in is the one that knows Thunder, which means after I knock it out, from here he is going to do progressively less and less damage. This is a general trend with the AI in Generation 2. They always want to send out the Pokemon that is best against your current Pokemon. They check type effectiveness to choose this. So for example, because I'm a rock water type, Lance is really not going to prioritize sending in his Charizard. And if the Dragonite that knew Thunder was his last Pokemon, he would have sent it in next anyways. The thing is here, his second Dragonite has Blizzard, so I can just use Recover and then finish it off. From there, Things are going to get much easier. He sends in his Ace Dragonite. I have a type advantage with Ancient Power. After that, it is time to one-hit KO the Charizard. Then he sends in Aerodactyl. This thing does no Rock Slide, which Corsola does not resist. Yes, the Rock type does not resist Rock type moves. So it does a decent amount of damage. Uh-oh, I'm fully paralyzed. Okay, it goes for Rock Slide again. This time, getting a critical hit, taking Corsola down to six hit points. Okay, that was really close. Luckily, my next Ancient Power connects, and the Aerodactyl goes down. Okay, so with Lance out of the way, I have access to the Move Tutor. By the way, this guy will not appear until you defeat the League, so none of these moves are available during the Johto portion of playthroughs. In this case, I'm going to teach Ice Beam in the place of Return, and then I'm also going to go back into the department store and grab another TM for Return, just in case I need it later on. In Kanto, I pick up the TM for Curse, because after all, Corsola is a weak, single-stage Pokémon, and I do think that I'm eventually going to need this move against Red.
Up next is the grass type specialist, Erica. You might think that she would give Corsola problems because she does do four times damage to my water rock typing. However, Ice Beam just gives me a series of one hits on all of her Pokemon. So yeah, let's move on to the next gym leader, who is Sabrina. And here I actually have more problems because Surf is just barely not one hit KOing her Pokemon. Now there was no move reminder in Generation 2, so I really didn't want to unlearn either Recover or Ancient Power. I guess I could have used the move deleter to forget Surf and then put Ice Beam in its place so that I would have Return to face Sabrina, but in the end I do manage to win. However, just barely, six hit points again. Okay, so you might expect Surge to cause issues, but no. He is awful. I knock out all of his Pokemon in a series of one hits. After that, the rest of the gym leaders in Kanto are completely trivial until I reach blue. For this fight, I love to use the leftovers just because he has six Pokemon and I want to have enough health to sustain throughout the entire fight. I want to hit KO the Pidgeot as well as the following Executor. In this case, he saw that grass moves are super effective, but he didn't know I had Ice Beam, so yeah, bad choice from him to send it in next. Alakazam though outspeeds, it sets up Reflect, and I do less than half with Ancient Power. The Retaliatory Psychic doesn't do that much to me though, and then I KO with Surf. Rhydon is obviously a one hit, and from here, things go downhill for Blue, because Arcanine doesn't have any good moves against me, I easily knock it out, and then against Gyarados I'm able to two hit when Reflect fades. Nice. Now I really need to get ready to face Red. I train against Wild Pokemon until level 70, then I teach Curse in the place of Ice Beam, and finally Rare Candy up to level 80. So now, let's do this. In the first fight, I learned a quick lesson. The answer is do not set up on the Pikachu. This is just a terrible choice. In the next fight, I go in and just decide to KO it right away with Surf, and then two hit the Espeon. What I was hoping for is that he would send out Snorlax next, and I could just set up with Curse and then sweep the rest of his team, but he chooses Venusaur, of course, because of the type effectiveness stuff I mentioned before. But the problem is, it's faster than Corsola by quite a bit. So as a result, it's able to hit Solar Beam before I get my second Ice Beam in. So that strategy is not going to work. I thought that maybe I can set up Curse against the Espeon and then one hit the Venusaur with Ancient Power. However, the issue here is that I get trapped using Recover over and over against the Espeon, stalling its Psychic out. But then it goes for Mud Slap, which lowers my accuracy. And now that is going to complicate things for the rest of the fight. Also, when I finally do make it back to the Venusaur, it has a Reflect in place from the Espeon, so my Ancient Power does uninspiring damage, even when my Corsola has plus 5 attack. So, that is another loss to Solar Beam. Okay, so I need a different strategy. Let's grab the Protect TM from the Celadon department store and go full Gen 2 with my moveset. Oh, by the way, I actually backtracked to Johto here and picked up the Quick Claw because I figured that I might need it. Anyways, the moveset that I'm going to shoot for for Red is going to be Curse, Recover, Protect, and Return with the leftovers at first. And then I realized something awful about this set. And that's the fact that Return's damage range isn't good enough to knock the Pikachu out. Even if I do manage to luck through the Pikachu and not have my attack lowered by Charm, the Espeon can crit, which stops Corsola dead in its tracks while it's trying to set up, so... Yeah, this is getting frustrating. Apparently though I can get the KO with Return on the Pikachu if I roll good damage. Okay, so I'm moving on to the Espeon with full health in this fight, and my attack stat complete. That means for the first time against the Espeon, I'm able to finally get set up to plus six. However, this does result in Corsola getting hit by two mud slaps before I move on to the Venusaur, and then in the moment of truth, my return misses, and Venusaur hits Corsola with Solar Beam, which by the way is a KO even from full health. Now I tried to switch up my strategy a little bit here, setting up against the Pikachu, using Recover, trying to deplete all of its uses of Thunder, however this isn't going to work out because it can paralyze you, and uh, yeah that's another reset. I tried the Quick Claw out, but it makes Recovering against the Espeon and stalling it out much more difficult, so I revert back to the leftovers to continue trying to luck out against Pikachu and Espeon and make it back to the Venusaur. Maybe I can get here and actually hit a return? It's worth considering that what I'm doing wrong here is setting up too much. 
Without Reflect, I might be able to do enough damage to the Venusaur with a lower stage modifier to still knock it out. In this case, I just really didn't want to get hit by Mud Slap. The Espeon uses Swift, so I can tell that it is out of Psychic uses, and that was my cue to try and get the sweep. So I go for Return and finish the Espeon off. Okay, so finally I have made it back to the Venusaur, and in this case I have a new strategy that I can use against it, because what I can do now is on the turns that it is setting up Solar Beam, I can use Curse to further boost my attack stat, and then Protect to foil Solar Beam. By doing this, I get all the way to plus 6, and then I finish it off. Honestly, thinking back to this fight now, I probably should have been trying to set up on the Venusaur exclusively and just knocking the Espeon out as fast as possible to prevent the chance for a Mud Slap or for a Critical Hit Psychic. But in the end, this is the strategy that ends up working for me. I'm able to sweep all the way to Red's final Pokemon, which is Charizard. It doesn't do that much to Corsola even with my special defense dropped, and with that, I have finally clocked in with a time of 2 hours, 4 minutes, and 55 seconds, with 12 resets at level 81. This took 7 hours and 21 minutes of game time. Alright, so this is where I ended the stream, and I did the next playthrough behind the scenes, specifically because while I was streaming Corsola, I had a massive technology meltdown. I have no idea what happened, but RBY XP Router, quite frankly, just melted down. It had so many error messages, and the route that I was working on basically completely corrupted. Also, my auto splitter was having some functions, and it failed to capture important data. So this was very frustrating for me, because I usually like to stream both my first and my second attempt. However, I did the second one behind the scenes after optimizing, and here are the results of that work. What I discovered is that Faulkner is a major issue. Remember when I said to keep this fight in mind for later? Yeah, he is almost impossible at level 13. It does not make sense to try him this low. Right now, we are watching a montage of my tests against him where I attempted to beat him at level 13. And uh, yeah, it is just not working. I will remind you that in my first playthrough, I beat him at level 12. So I got very lucky. In the end, what I decided to do with Corsola was train to level 13 on all of the other trainers and wild Pokemon, and then head into Sprout Tower and defeat the Bellsprout here. After all, I do have Tackle, so I can knock them out with this move, and that gives me enough experience to level all the way up to level 15 before Faulkner. I wish I could say that this is a guarantee now, it still isn't, but I have more health and I'm dealing slightly more damage, which is going to help. In this playthrough, I get lucky in my first attempt, and I do manage to defeat him. After that, I am not going to attempt either Bugsy or the rival in Azalea Town until I train to level 25. So I finish this off in Union Cave, get myself Bubble Beam, and that makes Bugsy completely trivial. And now we need to talk about the damage ranges against the rival, specifically his Bayleaf. At level 25 and 26, I have a 38% chance to get a 3 hit KO. That is honestly not very good. However, if I leveled up to level 27, this 38% chance for a 3 hit would jump up to 89% chance to 3 hit. And then at level 28, I would have a 100% chance to 3 hit. However, what I need to remind all of you of, well, maybe I don't have to remind you, is the fact that the Johto Wild Pokemon are at so low levels, like somewhere between 4 and 8 at this point. So training up two more levels from 25 to 27 to get a major increase in my chance to 3 hit just doesn't really seem worth it to me. I think that in general, having some resets here on the rival, and just like fighting him three times and eventually getting the 38% chance to three hit on the Bayleaf is going to be the best choice. After all, there are many things that can go wrong with the Bayleaf's AI. Number one, Razor Leaf can just miss. Number two, it can choose to set up, which would be Poison Powder or Reflect or Growl. The last two of these obviously do nothing to Corsola because it is using Bubble Beam. Also, I should mention that I am going to survive one Razor Leaf even if it gets a crit. Making the rest of the fight consistent is the fact that I have guaranteed one hits on both the Ghastly and the Zubat, so really I just have to focus on the Bayleaf. Unfortunately for me today, the Bayleaf chooses Razor Leaf on the first turn, so in the first fight, I do take a loss. However, in the second battle, it goes for Poison Powder, followed by Growl, and then it misses a Razor Leaf, and I easily knock it out. So as you can see, things can either go extremely badly for Corsola, or they can go really well. 
Okay, so up next is Whitney, and she is completely easy, so Corsola takes a nice victory here. And with that, let's talk about hidden power for this second playthrough. I made an overlay update before I did this playthrough, so you can actually see Corsola's hidden power typing on the right-hand side of the screen. For this playthrough, I have chosen hidden power flying. It is not the best hidden power typing, because you have 12 in your attack DV and 13 in your defense DV. Unfortunately, because the HP DV is calculated based on all of your other DVs, you're only gonna get 7 HP. However, for Corsola, I think that this trade-off is worth it because it solves a lot of problems throughout the playthrough. Also, immediately after picking it up, I head to Olivine City, and after passing through this location, I can head to the beach and pick up the Sharp Beak. So this base 70 power move gets a boost from Faulkner's badge, I get the badge boost for my attack stat, and I get the boost from the Sharp Beak. So it's actually pretty good throughout the mid game. Also, the next major battle is the rival in Burned Tower, and once again here he has a Bayleaf, but I can just use Hidden Power Flying to one-shot it, so he's not a problem at all. Now against Morty, I have no problems. I actually get one hits on all of his team members, even the Gengar. Plus, I had the Mint Berry just in case. Following that is Chuck, and for this fight I have Hidden Power Flying, so I have a one hit on the Primeape and a two hit on the Polyrath. If I just have the Mint Berry, then he can't put me to sleep, there's basically no way for me to lose this fight. Uh, price is price. Don't know what to tell you here. I have one hits on all of his Pokemon. Then I have Surf for Jasmine. And after this, I was actually realizing that Corsola is fantastic throughout the mid game of Johto. I think most of us really underestimate just how good this thing is. And interestingly enough, that is around the time that you would ordinarily catch this thing, because you can get it in Olivine City. So I really think that people should maybe reconsider this cute little piece of sea coral. Anyways, now let's face Claire. Once again here, I am going to use the Recover strategy. I get really lucky in this fight because the first two Dragoners both miss Thunder Wave, so I only get paralyzed on the last one, and then against the Kingdra, but I still hit both of my attacks, and I managed to win. Only one reset so far, and I'm heading into the league. Both Will and Koga aren't an issue, so I'm just gonna skip both of them. And then I want to talk about Bruno, because Hidden Power Flying dramatically improves my chances at this fight. Previously, I think I could have lost against the Machamp if Crossdrop got a critical hit, but in this case, because I have Hidden Power Flying, I can one-hit KO all three of the first hit mons, which means I only get hit by a single Mock Punch before the Machamp comes out. This means I have much more health, and then I can just spam Hidden Hidden Power Flying and knock it out without wasting time using Recover, giving him more chances to get a critical hit. After that, I surf the Onyx and move on to Karen. Here you'll notice that I've trained to a higher level, level 60. Now, I have a guaranteed 2 hit on the Umbreon, making it more consistent, and then I can use Hidden Power Flying to 2 hit the Vile Plume. After that, Gengar goes for Curse, and I finish it off, and from there, Karen is defeated. So now I want to briefly talk about Lance. I am once again going to use the Recover strategy here. Now I did consider choosing Hidden Power Ice just to make this fight a little bit faster, but overall I think that Hidden Power Flying has more utility for Corsola throughout the playthrough. Also I tend to not like to use Hidden Power to solve problems that the Pokemon already has an answer for. Because in this case, using the Recovery strategy, I am able to defeat Lance on my first attempt once again, so he is not a problem even though the fight is a little bit slow. Okay, so now let's jump way ahead to the blue fight, and here you'll notice my stats. I am using Curse for this fight. I don't really think that I needed to, because Corsola stacks up quite well against his team, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. This fight is easy either way. Now after that, I train on wild Pokemon up to level 73. This is very important, so I am getting three more levels in this playthrough, because now with 10 rare candies, I can take on red at level 83. This level dramatically improves the first two Pokemon on his team. Against the Pikachu, I now have a 71% chance to knock it out with a single return. Unfortunately though, it is going to get one attack in, and in this case it's Thunder, which gets a critical hit and it paralyzes Corsola, so that is a reset. However, what I want to have happen is basically protect Charm, then use Return, one hit the Pikachu, and move on to the Espeon. Against this thing, if it doesn't set up Reflect, I am going to have a two hit, so I just go for that right away, and in this case I luck out with a critical hit, knocking the Espeon out in one turn. As I said before, what makes most sense now is to set up against the Venusaur, I use Recover, then Protect, and then I start alternating between Curse and Protect. Once I'm fully set up, I can then just time my attacks and sweep through the rest of Red's team. By the way, you might be wondering how many curses I need to one-shot all of his Pokemon, and it is in fact six. The Snorlax has a small chance to survive when you have plus five, but since setup is basically free on the Venusaur, 
I do not want to chance it because if the Snorlax attacks and uses Body Slam and paralyzes me, then things could fall apart. So plus six is just the safer choice. And with it, I clock in with a much better time. One hour, 48 minutes and 51 seconds with two resets at level 84. This took seven hours and three minutes of game time. So if we compare the real times, I am now 16 minutes and four seconds faster. That's really great. I also had 10 less resets. I did finish at a higher level because I needed to add some consistency to the final fight, but I still got a lower game time. So the way that it's possible for me to reduce the game time and reduce the resets at the same time is because in the second playthrough, I had to do much less backtracking. Moments in the first playthrough, when I backtracked to Kanto to pick up the Quick Claw, that wastes a lot of game time and real time. Whereas in this case, I didn't do that, my route was much more efficient and well planned, so as a result, I saved a lot of game time. Now let's talk about my Johto tier list, because we have to place Corsola in it. But before we do that, I want to mention one change that I made. If you look at the bottom of the tier list, where Ditto is, I changed it from the Impossible tier to the Improbable tier. I think that that's fair, because I did find out that Ditto can beat the game, it is just extremely unlikely. In the future I will add a new tier when we find a truly impossible Pokemon, but for now I'm just going to leave the Improbable tier as the lowest possible result. Right above that, of course, is the Bruno tier. You might wonder about the criteria to enter this tier. If the Pokemon had a really bad real time and it felt like pure pain to play, then it goes in the Bruno tier. So where does Corsola earn a spot? And honestly, this thing did quite well. The most comparable Pokemon in the tier list currently is Skarmory. Yes, Skarmory. Corsola is only 43 seconds slower. It had the same number of resets in its final playthrough, Corsola was 11 levels higher, and that's due to its fast growth rate. Also, it took three more minutes of game time, so all of its metrics were slightly worse. You might be wondering, why was Skarmory so bad? Well, I would encourage you to check out the video, Skarmory vs. Mantine. It's an unlikely duo, and I think it's a fun video. Anyways, the reason it was so bad is just that it has the slow growth rate and an absolutely terrible move pool. Corsola, on the other hand, has a quite good growth rate, and it also has a decent move pool. Also, I just want to mention the fact that Water Rock is a good typing for Johto. Not in the early game, that is. Like, Corsola has an awful early game. But once it clears that, then it's off to the races. So today it's getting itself a D tier finish, but I think if it had a better normal type move in the early game, or maybe a better water type move, it might have been able to get into the C tier. Another improvement for Corsola would also be giving it the medium slow growth rate. You might think that this makes no sense because isn't the fast growth rate the best? And no, until level 30, the medium slow growth rate levels up faster, which would really help solve Corsola's Azalea Town problem. And here, I want to mention something which is, of course, a bias in my playthroughs. I am always going to be facing the rival who has the hardest starter to defeat. It would be quite simple to give the rival the Typhlosion team, and in that case, Corsola would have many less problems getting through Azalea Town. Anyways, maybe one of you will one day record one of those playthroughs and post it on a different channel. I would love to see it. So that's it for Corsola, and now I want to make an announcement. I have officially released my Generation 1 overlay for the community to use. You do not need to support me through Patreon or YouTube memberships to get access to it, and it does not cost money, it is completely free. Also, I am totally fine with you using this overlay in your own videos. And I really want to state this here, while I may have developed this software myself and created all of the graphics myself, please do not leave mean comments on anyone else's videos if you see them using this overlay. I am more than happy to see more people using it because I just think it's a great way to visualize information while playing the game. Also, you might not want to make your own videos and that's totally fine too. You can just use the overlay in your free time to beat the old Kanto games and have some fun. So if you're curious about using it, check out the link in the description. By the way, it has just been released today, so there still might be some bugs. Please report them to me by sending me an email. I have left that email underneath the link in the description. I will try and fix the bugs as fast as is possible. Do note that this overlay is specifically only for Generation 1 right now. 
I intend to release Generation 2 and Generation 3 at a later date, but preparing these pieces of software takes a lot of time, and I do also have to focus on video production. The last note is that the software is optimized for solo playthroughs, so if you're playing a Nuzlocke or something like that, it is not really going to respond how you would want it to. I intend to make software for both regular playthroughs and Nuzlocke's, and release those at a later date, but don't hold your breath for that, it's probably going to be at least a year before we see it. Okay, so that's it for this video. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so you'll be notified when I post more content. Also, everyone who's watching, it would be great if you all thanked all of my YouTube members and Patreon supporters because they have enabled me to have the time to prepare this software to release to all of you. So thank you so much. If you've made it this far in the video, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next one.